Good morning. How is everybody? So, um, who who saw Costow's talk at the end of the day yesterday? It, chef Christopher Costow, um, claim to fame, was like one of the third youngest chefs ever to get three Michelin stars. Um, his restaurant Charter Oak was um, my dinner plan last night. So I went into the um, Google reception saying, "I'm gonna look at stuff, but mostly I'm just gonna smell." because uh, Chef Costao has a penchant for destroying you with food, and I knew I needed to be prepared. And um, so I just wandered around, and it was a series of, oh, that looks kind of, okay, I gotta try that. And then I tried things. That was like several levels above any food that has ever been served at any CIA conference reception. So please round of applause for Google. They only do 175,000 covers a day, so I'm glad they learned. Um, we're, so yesterday, we t I, I asked if we want to talk about um, weed or butter first. Um, today, I would love to talk about Instagram and race. 
Who wants to go first? <laughs> For real. Okay, Instagram. So um, one of the big things that we're gonna be talking about and we have been talking about is this idea of digital ubiquity and all of the exciting things and all the I exciting share of information. Um, the truth is, and this comes from a person who has so many times pitched way cooler flavor profiles for potato chips than ended up on the market. There is a lot of tribal knowledge that consumers will only eat barbecue or chocolate chip. Um, and one of the things that's going to help us topple that whatever archie it is, is um, the fact that right now I can open up Instagram and I can look at what some amazing crazy person is doing in Sweden or Japan or Peru and instantly that food trend can be transferred into my being. Um, I, used, I first started cooking in restaurants in Denver, um, very much pre-Instagram, and it was amazing because the second that a food trend came to Denver, we knew that it was uh, what was cool five years ago in New York. We were, it was, it was like um, looking at the end of the universe and this is what happened 13 billion years ago, only cupcakes hit Denver in like 2006. Um, so, with, with that, um, and with culinary science the, and, and talking about food, um, one of our most powerful engines for innovation, once we now have a consumer base that is more mobile and ready to start accepting things, is decoupling ideas from tradition. Um, I, I went to uh, Japan earlier this year for a umami conference, which was very dope. Um, and uh, my big keynote speech was that, sorry guys, uh, there is nothing Japanese about umami. Like, the food culture of Japan has made leaps and bounds in leveraging umami like nobody else, but there is nothing uh, particular to any nation or any tradition or any history about hydrolyzing protein to free amino acids and having that taste savor in your mouth. And that is not meant to obliterate one of the greatest food traditions in the world or what disparage what they've contributed. Um, it's meant to say, we don't have to just be doing teriyaki chicken wings. Um, if we want to make something that fits into Northern California, we can make, and we have made, miso out of scarlet runner beans and farro. And maybe it doesn't need to be called miso anymore. Maybe it can just be a savory paste. And so that brings me to race. Um, you guys know how uh, in 50 years everybody's going to look like Rami Malek? <laughs> Which, like, is not the worst thing. Um, there, I don't think the same thing's going to happen in food. People are still going to want to go to Italian restaurants. People are still going to pick up the Zatar wheat thin when that comes out. But uh, I am, I'm half Iranian, half Texan, and I have never felt... Uh, uh, prickly about cultural appropriation of food. I want more people to be bastardizing shish kebab so I can have it in more places. Um, but that is always a conversation. When we get into today, um, some of the first talks about scale and responsibility, this is a big one that's gonna come up. As food becomes more global, who says that um, a American chef in Portland can be the name in the United States for Thai food? Um, that's a very sticky thing. And I have to say this, for outside of the, the restaurant chef world, um, this, is, this is not a problem for top tier restaurant chefs. And it kind of hasn't been since the 90s. And one of the reasons that is, is because again, it's all about the food. That wonderful conversation yesterday about what do you call a mushroom taco? That's great for stealth health and all those things. It's also great for just making standalone food. And um, I, I think uh, people in food service and in CPG are gonna start being less concerned about like throwing random Chinese characters onto a menu to signal that this is the flavor experience you're gonna have, and they're gonna spend more time just thinking about star anise, and they're gonna spend more time thinking about black vinegar, and maybe they just say those two things, and then marketing doesn't get them screwed on the cultural appropriation tip. Um, that, that's my thought there. Um, <laughs> so um, we're gonna get on to the next speaker. One last housekeeping note. Um, I've been talking a lot about new products and crazy things. We have some state bird seed that I'm gonna be uh, throwing at people during uh, the book signing at the reception. So um, I'm gonna introduce Beth Nowitt. Um, she's a writer for Fortune and is the patient zero harbinger of the coolest quote that people have been throwing around forever that uh, 
25 of the biggest food companies lost $18 billion in the first half of this decade. So tell us about that. Beth? Lost the rest of our panel. Here they go. Okay, great. Great start. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay, so this is a really, I'm a, I write about business, uh, business of food. So for me, this is sort of the most interesting, I'm biased, of course, interesting uh, panel for me. Um, so we're just going to each, I'm going to give everybody a couple of seconds here, a couple minutes uh, to give a little background um, and help set the scene here about why you're the right person for this session on scale and responsibility. So John, let's start with you. Um, we're catching you at an interesting moment um, near, after nearly two decades running Annie's. Mm -hmm. You've just co-founded a baby food startup with Jennifer Garner. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit. What's, yeah, what's it's going a little crazy. Um, so I was with Annie's for about 18 years, and we were a really small food company, and we were going in and trying to sell natural and organic and kind of better for you alternatives to grocers many years ago when those sections didn't exist and most people thought organic was a fad. Um, we heard that over and over again. It's now almost 50 billion, so I think you can say it's not a fad now. <laughs> um, but we grew that business um, up until about 2012. We took it public. General Mills bought it in 2014. And so I've, up until just uh, a month ago, I spent three years with General Mills, like integrating Annie's, keeping it separate, but developing a kind of a new business model for a um, an organic values, purpose-driven brand that was all about social environmental responsibility and driving environmental, um, positive environmental impact and purpose, um, and keeping that authentic and then leveraging it at scale inside Mills, which was fascinating. Um, and then I thought there was a tremendous opportunity in white space in kids' food. There's a lot of, uh, quote unquote, healthier kids' options out there. There aren't a lot that kids actually like to eat. And there's a tremendous opportunity to, to really reframe that category in a whole bunch of ways. So. Um, Jennifer Garner and two other founders got together. We started a, a, a HPP, pre pressure processed, um, cold pressed baby food company, and then we're going to build it up into a kids brand um, all the way up to age 12 eventually, but most of what we'll do will be age 5 and under. But it's a reinvention of food. To me, it's like 3.0 or organic 3.0, like not just better than the alternatives and organic and all that stands for, but now better, more positive nutrition real nutrition that kids um, need desperately. And so we're going to try to help mom solve that problem. Great. Great. Now, Will, so you are senior advisor to Al Gore's Generation Investment Management, founder of the Republic of Tea, leader of the Food Venture Lab, co-founder of VC firm. Okay, okay. Business. <laughs> I mean, it's exhausting. I'm it's, just um, reading this, this and it's impressive. exhausting. And you told me before that you are also a magician. So how do, yeah. how do you do this? How do you do it all? Tell, tell us what you're saying. In journalism, you bury the lead. <laughs> bury the lead, yeah. Right. One thing leads to another. So um, just, you know, you were talking about mission-driven, and um, I've had many sort of accidental opportunities in, in my life. I was, um, in my late 20s, I was invited to this really interesting new tribe of people called Social Venture Network, which was a group of kind of, people who had inherited a bunch of money and a bunch of people who had kind of come out of the 60s wanting to change the world through entrepreneurship. And it turned out that a lot of them were trying to do it in food or in things that really connected with people on a visceral level. So I went to this conference and in one day I met Ben and Jerry themselves. I met um, Gary Hirschberg. I met Paul Hawken. Um, I remember I met Jeff Hollander. All these people that were kind of like gurus of what became the organic and natural movement and my life changed that weekend. I was like, I have to do this. I have to figure out how to do this, you know? And so I ended up starting, co-founding this company, The Republic of Tea. And out of that came a book called The Republic of Tea, How an Idea Becomes a Business. And then that book got assigned as a case study on business school campuses. It was the first book to really articulate how do you articulate and design a business that's mission driven? How do you align your own values? And within, when I, so I just want to connect this. So when I launched Republic of Tea, I did it at the Gourmet Product Show in San Francisco in 1992. After the first day of having one day in a trade show, I literally got a phone call from Howard Schultz himself, who was the CEO of Starbucks. And he said, 
hey, there were some people from Starbucks at the show today, and they said I should really meet you. And so that was the beginning of my sort of interesting dance with, you know, being an entrepreneur and then talking to the leading company in a space. And I've just been fascinated how that's evolved. And, you know, now 20-something years later, 25 years later, we can talk about how that's become a mature practice of this kind of, you know, competition, cooperation, coopetition, you know, whatever you want to talk, call it. Um, Victor, you also wear a lot of hats. I don't know if you wear quite as many. He's not practice. quite as old. <laughs> All right, well, I'll let you do He's still got that. But, uh, <laughs> so you're co-founder of S2G Ventures, founder and chairman of Food Shot, um, and executive chairman of plant-based food company Lava. So tell us what's going on. Uh, well, first, uh, I'd like to say that all the work that I do couldn't have been done without what these two guys do. We have to really think about foundations that are being built, what has been done, how to build on that and sort of keep uh, the movement going. So one is just to say to uh, Will and to John, thanks for uh, all their work. Um, I think my story in um, food started um, at a kind of, uh, I don't know, just a <clears throat> revelation kind of event in um, Valencia, Spain. Uh, I was not looking for uh, a kind of epiphany, but kind of epiphany happened. And in kind of keeping with the theme here, we hear food is food. It was really just a food is food, you know, experience. Uh, I ate a peach at the Central Market in Valencia, Spain. I did not recognize it as anything that I had ever eaten or experienced before. Um, that was in 2012. I had been doing systems investing, kind of pioneering that idea of how do you invest not just in companies but into systems because systems have, you know, dynamics. There are, um, uh, you know, sort of macro ideas that are pushing it forward. There are needs that have to be uh, fulfilled, whether it's an energy system or a water system. And when I ate this peach, it's like, oh my God, I've been eating you know, something that looks like it, but it's a shadow, you know, kind of the real thing. And why is that? And started doing some research and was like, oh my God, food is a system. And as an American consumer, you know, I just thought like everybody else, food shows up, you go to the supermarket, you, you know, you eat it. Um, and my insight was that system is going to radically change over the next five years, so that was, you know, 2011. Um, and based on, you know, that idea, I um, co-founded S2G, um, and that's a venture fund that's focused on um, investing in food and ag across the systems, soil to shelf, and uh, to move that system forward so you can get more healthy, sustainable, you know, traceable, safe, flavorful, enjoyable food. Equitable. Equitable. Will was one of the first guys I um, actually reached out to um, when uh, S2G was coming together. Uh, 30 investments uh, in at this point. Once Upon a Farm is actually one uh, of our uh, Gee, investments. What a um, <laughs> and uh, um, so that's uh, S2G. Um, I, on Food Shot Global, it's a new initiative. Uh, it's focused on global food challenges, so how are global food systems going to change? So I've brought together um, Rabobank, which is a Dutch uh, bank uh, that does a lot of um, banking in food and agriculture, probably the leading bank, uh, Generation, uh, which Will is uh, involved in as well. Uh, Mars, UC Davis, they have a new Institute for Food uh, and Health, um, which is really fascinating. A stone Barn Center um, and a bunch of uh, venture capital funds to find the most interesting, transformative, game-changing companies and research uh, that could move the needle on big global uh, challenges. So we're launching that in the next couple of months. And then I think, as you heard uh, yesterday, co-founded uh, Alpha Labs with Danielle and uh, Mike, and there the idea is to get. Um, you know, products out into the market that are aligned to these new drivers on uh, healthier, sustainable, and equitable food. Um, and then, uh, of course, Lava, uh, which I invested in from the S2G side, now executive chairman, hit the shelves uh, this week, which we're very uh, excited about. Nikki is the CMO, um, great team. 
Um, and I think it's uh, potentially a game changer in the non-dairy uh, you know, category. So I think in summary, what I think I do best is um, build platforms that can make a difference and uh, create change um, by bringing creativity, capital, um, and entrepreneurship into uh, new ideas. Yeah. Great, great. So I think one thing we should just address right away is that you know, the, something that's alluded to in the framework of this conversation is that there's a tension between scale and purpose. And I think we should talk about that first. You know, when did big food become bad in the eyes of the consumer? Is that real? Is that overblown? And is it that changing? And John, maybe you'd be a good person to start talking about yeah. that. <clears throat> Um, just, just so you know, big food doesn't like being called big food. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> I learned that on my first week at General Mills. So what's, <laughs> what's a nice, what, what else can we, what could we, what's like another term? No, I think, I think it's appropriate. I mean, just these large multi Legacy? <laughs> Legacy? Traditional? I didn't attach as much negative connotation to it as I think they felt, um, what had been attached to it by others. But I think, I think it really gets down to, you know, the industrialization of the food system post the war. I mean, it's pretty... It's pretty obvious, like, what worked. It was basically, like, make the cheapest stuff you can with the fattest gross margin you can and then carpet bomb a message onto the masses because they can only get the message on three channels or in their newspaper or on, on the radio station they could get. And, and, and then they sell a lot of it and they make a ton of money. That was an awesome, amazing business model for decades. And then this unfortunate thing happened, which is the population started to change, and um, you had different kinds of consumers uh, coming along that had different drivers in their, in their set, you know, values and um, interest in better health and all these things that were, that have been really unlocked by technology and the internet and, and the ability to get all the information you could ever want on your cell phone in, in five seconds on a question you have about food or health or a brand. And so it's completely changed the game. And I think what's interesting is like the big food companies now are challenged. I've worked inside one now for three years. I can tell you there's a lot of amazing, awesome, super smart, high integrity people in these big companies. And they know that the, that the game's changing and they're trying to figure out how to adapt and they're doing so in uh, many ways, starting small funds that are investing in the front end so they're closer to trends, really smart. They're, they're buying companies like Annie's and trying not to ruin them, letting them hold on to culture, which is all about Purpose-driven companies have very strong differentiated cultures almost every time, and how do you how do you help it scale without ruining it? It's a very it's not an easy equation, um, but I think there's a lot of uh, hope inside the big companies that they can figure it out. But it's not going to be easy. It's going to take an another decade. Well, I was going to just say one of the ch challenges is the incentive structures because the big companies yeah. have been populated with people who are really good at optimizing for short-term mm -hmm. results you know, which are driven by the needs of the market, you know, the stock market and, mm -hmm. and asset holders. Um, one of the things that I keep thinking about, and I, all of us have talked about, is, you know, how do you um, get the, uh, the public, the people who are eating the products, to, you know, appreciate what the real cost of them is, um, what the externalities are that come out of a system that's just optimizing for profit short-term profit, what, what are the implications in terms of the health of the population? Uh, Jerry Mann told us yesterday that we just hit 40% obesity rate in this country. Mm -hmm. And we know that 45% of the climate impacts from industrial agriculture drive climate change, so, or drive 45% of climate change. So I, I think what, what's, what's challenging is for those big companies to change the incentive structures. You know, they've now learned how to create a membrane or an interface to to interact with innovation and innovative people, but they still lose them. <laughs> right. Well, we're I mean, talk about that. That. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, we were just on another conversation this week where we had John Sebastiani, who started Crave Jerky and lasted exactly 12 months to the day of his contract with Hershey, and Greg Steltenpol, of course, who sold his company to Coke and did not, you know, continue. So it's temporary right now, but part of it is the way people are compensated. And, and then what's really driving, so. Yeah, to, to build on that, I mean, I think Will hit it on the head. I, when I get asked to sort of come in and, you know, talk to companies, or I'm asked, you know, on a panel like this, you know, if you had five minutes with a CEO of a big 
you know, food company, you know, what would you, what advice would you uh, give them? And I think people expect that, you know, it would be the kind of usual things around, you know, engage with third party, you know, platforms, you know, do the fund, you know, really, you know, immerse yourself in innovation. But I do think it's incentives. I think they have to find a way to create some safe space within, you know, the company in which, you know, the CFO, the CMO, you know, all, and the product development teams can say, hey, we're going to do this project together, you know, to to accomplish something that we think this company needs to do, and their bonuses and their, you know, their um, job security and all of those things aren't challenged, you know, by doing that, so they don't get pulled into these sort of short, you know, term, you know, incentives. I think that's sort of a critical, you know, aspect. They of, need you know. underlying capital structures. So I mean, what you didn't hear yesterday from Mark Alexander is that the capital structure of Campbell's actually affords them a more a longer term perspective same with Unilever just in terms of what force um, the ex, you know external forces of the marketplace forcing them to make more profit so when we talked a little bit about 3G yesterday and right. their model right so it, Unilever Cam Campbell any other companies that you think well, are Mars is like that they're private right yeah. mm -hmm. Cargill is private so I think that's so being private it's the it's biggest a, right. private, isn't it, in the world? Sorry? It's the, the biggest private yeah. corporation yeah. in the world. Okay. Um, so, John, let's go back to you for a second mm -hmm. and talk about why you left. Um, yeah. So you were inside um, a big food company, sorry to big food companies, um, mm -hmm. for three years. Mm -hmm. You know, what did, why, why did you feel like it was time to leave and, and what were maybe some of the, the pros and cons that you that you felt when you were there. Yeah, um, I, I, I told myself when, I, I had a one-year contract too. <laughs> I think when they bought the business, they expected that I would blow up at the end of one year. And it wasn't, it wasn't a one-year like, hey, and we'll talk about it. It was one year and like, see you later. That, that's very common. But about, I think, you know, hopefully like a few months in, I think they realized that I had a longer vision. And I, I didn't really want to leave Annie's until I felt it was ready where the business was successful enough, it was integrated enough, the culture had been protected. So after you work for some place for so long and you feel like you've had a small part in building this legacy, the last thing you want to do is leave it in a way that it might end up being not there or different in a negative way. So um, I felt we had gotten there. The business had doubled. General Mills had taken a lot of our um, vision and, and instilled it into a lot of things they were doing in a massive way they're converting a quarter of a million acres to organic. They're, um, they, they had a really well-developed climate mitigation you know, policy and, and uh, initiatives around soil and air and water that they were working on, but they really doubled those down. And so I felt like it, we were really in a great place. And at the same time, I also felt like um, I could continue to be involved with them and help them on the things that matter most, which really is about culture. Like the, I think there's this incentives issue, which is a big one, but also I think it's about culture, entrepreneurial culture, and like how do you how do you instill that into a bigger organization? It's very difficult. So I'm still engaged with them, helping them in that in that area and on the, these environmental and social issues and on the brand. But I felt like also like I had the opportunity to to really drive another big wave of disruption and change, or at least play a part in that um, that would push kids' health forward and as an entrepreneur I felt like I needed to take I needed to do it it was um, exciting scary as hell um, I don't know if we'll be successful um, I, I wake up at night sweating over like the person I just hired knowing that they depend on me now it's like it's that's what entrepreneurs do you know I forgot about that a little bit I hadn't done that for about 15 20 years so. right right but anyway so I'm gonna be just um, both John and Will's color man here so it's like what um, there are two things. I think once upon a farm, John joining that team and obviously uh, Jennifer coming along with it is one of the significant events of this year from a food industry uh, standpoint. I put a couple other headlines on it. Obviously, um, you know Amazon, you know Whole Foods, um, the spectacular failure of Juicero. Um, uh, um, you know, the Tyson investment into, uh, you know, 
beyond meat. Um, but I think what, uh, you know, John and Jennifer joining uh, Once Upon a Farm and looking to take that to the network is one of the, I mean, to the next height is, I think small food companies or authentic, you know, new momentum brands, like I think, you know, Once Upon a Farm is, one of the big challenge they have is getting to that scale. And a lot of the challenges, you know, ultimately come down to people. And there's, um, you know, operational expertise and talent are not abundant, you know, in that there are great founders that drive, you know, these companies over, you know, a couple of years forward. But getting operational talent or those founders growing quick enough from in their operational expertise is difficult. Mm -hmm. And then marketing a new brand is costly, a lot of moving parts. To have, um, you know, a uh, person like Jennifer Gardner who can come in and there's an instant megaphone, you know, on the brand, its values, what it's doing. That combination of those two entering a small company is a significant seismic, you know, event. And my um, uh, projection would be There'll be others, you know, taking that model that, you know, sort of, uh, you know, John uh, has done and, you know, really accelerating, you know, the growth of those kind of, you know, companies and they'll be more successful and they'll scale faster, be more attractive to big companies on the M&A side. But then to John's other point is that what happens to these companies when they get absorbed into big boot companies, the culture and the incentives really, you know, kick in. And there are not a lot of success stories. Right. I mean, what what John is poised, you know, to do, you know, in Annie's and General Mills, I think is a great example of, you know, um, a potential success, you know, there. What Seth did, you know, at Honest Tea, I think is another, you know, example. You know, Gary, you know, in well, terms so of... So is, is this the... You know, we're talking about selling, right? Is is that the, <clears throat> what are the other alternative paths that maybe are as good or better? Is that, are there? Well, you know, a lot of companies that I know, uh, some companies that I know that are at a scale now where they're having a lot of conversations with strategic <clears throat> acquirers and they, first you enter into this conversation about how much, you know, how much can the big company do to help you grow and maybe we'll just make an investment or take a minority position. Um, no, I'll, I'll use an example um, of a company that I've been involved with for many years called Revolution Foods, which was started by Kirsten Toby and Kristen Richmond, actually as a project in the social entrepreneurship class at Berkeley that I teach. And um, they're at a scale now. They're uh, serving close to 3 million healthy meals a week in uh, seven different states, about 25 different markets. They're having a real impact. They also just had a study come out from Harvard School of Public Health that showed that the kids who are eating the healthy meals are actually getting better um, great, you know, performance outcomes through their grades. I mean, it's not, yeah, it's kind of like, duh, but yeah, now we have cl <laughs> clinical evidence that it's true. Um, but, you know, they're, they're at a point where they're very mission-driven. They're, uh, the mission is actually embedded through the investor base. It's a very interesting investor base of both sort of what you call impact investors, family offices, um, foundations, and, and conventional venture capitalists. So it's a very unique kind of you know, conversation. And there's a lot of discussion about how do you maintain the autonomy that you need to um, carry that mission forward. And, you know, one of the new models that, that kind of pioneered it with Unilever was when they bought Ben and Jerry's, they set it up as it's, you know, they kept it pretty autonomous. It has its own board. Um, it doesn't have its own shareholders, but it has its own board. Right. Um, of course, we know like Plum was acquired as a for-benefit corporation, and they've stayed that way, and now they've influenced. Um, and then I just to answer the question, there are some larger funds that are looking at what they're calling a permanent capital vehicle. So if a company were to actually get to a place where it's performing and, you know, making a profit and potentially distributing a dividend, it seems like there's an interest from some long-term asset holders like 
large family offices, sovereign wealth funds. They're interested in saying, we, we would be happy to keep that company public as long as it is generative, you know, and we could provide additional capital as well. Yeah. So I want to, Victor, you touched on a couple big headlines that I think we should dive into. And one um, is Juicero, and, and not specifically that company, but I'm, I want to talk a little bit about the influence that techno the tech sector has had on food, right? Because oh, every company's a tech company now, or wants to be. And so we're seeing a lot of companies build themselves as food tech. And so what are the expectations then that come with that when it comes to growth and valuation, and can that be damaging? Um, I don't know if any of you want to speak to that, but what have you seen there? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's, yeah, I mean, I think the next year you're going to have a clear view of that. I think the signals are kind of there, right. which is, it's not so much a discussion around entrepreneurs who are doing food and technology. I think it really has to do with the investment community. Mm -hmm. I think it's an investment community yeah. issue in which, you know, I think, you know, Silicon Valley in terms of, you know, kind of large fund tech investors um, see food as an interesting, you know, kind of area. They have a lot of money. Um, they, uh, you know, believe that I think food is ready to be disrupted in this in this way in which you get these, you know, really fast, you know, momentous, you know, growth curves. And if you you know if you keep putting large war chests together, you know, to help that you know grow quickly, that you can take over an entire sector or an entire you know area. And I just think food doesn't function you know, like that. And so all of the, you know, companies that have that DNA, where they took big war chests, you know, um, have a food tech angle, um, are going to find that there, there's tension in what they have to produce over the next, you know, couple of years to be rational for those investors, the valuations, all of those are, you know, um, are not aligned, I think. Um, I think food is food. Um, clean tech, I think that, you know, they kind of tried the same thing and it didn't work because energy was something, you know, different. So, uh, you know, I think. Yeah, I was just gonna add, there's also a tremendous echo chamber in Silicon Valley and as, as Victor pointed out, you know, food's a gigantic business. Some people say it's 26 trillion. Some people say it's 7 trillion. I mean, it's just a big market. Venture capitalists love big markets. They also love things that can scale with capital efficiency. And, and your point is when you're making something and it has a supply chain and has a lot of people that have to touch it, it's, it's complicated and it's expensive and it's historically low margins, which is very different than the kinds of companies that have been financed. Right. So. And just taking like kind of lava, you know, as an example, you know, and once upon a farm, I'm sure is, you know, working through a lot of these issues. It's like, okay, if you're going to do clean label, you know, you're going to be authentic, you know, all of these value driven, you know, sort of products, the entire system has been set up to do a different kind of product, you know, <laughs> and, and this is really the non sexy stuff. Like, I'm sure if there are investors or entrepreneurs in the world, you know, you say the word co packer. And you just, you know, your mind can explode. I mean, there's just, you know, there, we're finding, you know, with lava, we have to reinvent co-packing. And actually, we have a question on the screen here. What is lava? Oh, okay. That was my fault. I should have made you explain. Go ahead. Oh, um, so lava is a new non-dairy uh, yogurt. Um, I think from our team perspective and certainly from the investment standpoint, think it will be the category leader in non-dairy. I think in the last couple of days, we've had a lot of discussions around, you know, what is food and technology? I believe lava represents that technology can actually be the chemistry and biology of simple ingredients put together in really, really smart ways. We have a saying one plus one equals seven at lava. So it's just, um, 
It's a peely nut, which is a, um, a nut from the Philippines that has these amazing emulsification you know, properties to it. It's plantains. Um, it's got you know, cassava root. It's got you know, coconut or all the other you know, kind of things. But the chemistry of those things working together, um, we have the highest I think, probiotic count of any yogurt in the market because these ingredients and the cultures are feeding off of each other. Um, so I think the, the new technology going forward is going to be, how do you create clean label? Mm -hmm. You know, do that where you're creating a flavorful, amazing food experience. Um, but now you have to reinvent the way it's manufactured in order to deliver that. Because all of this infrastructure that's built over the last 70 years has been for adding sugars, you know, cutting corners, you know, all of these stabilizers, all this stuff that none of the consumers want. And so, like, actually doing the manufacturing of it is very difficult. I know, you know. No, it gets to the, the, the point is, like, the food business is really a tough business. And you got to go in and sell into category reviews. You got to work with brokers. You got to work with co-packers. There's regulatory, FDA. And so when you, when that's the reality of it. And as Will mentioned, it's low, relatively low margin. And then if you throw expectations and just... Just throwing more money at it is not going to make any of that stuff easier. <laughs> well, I was going to I was going to go back because what happened, you know, it was so the VCs were looking for the next big thing. You know, they'd done um, microprocessors, they'd done information technology. You know, they, they as Victor mentioned, they sort of had a spectacular disaster in clean tech, okay. and now they're like, what's the next big market that we haven't really invested in? So what happened was some of those legendary um, investors. Uh, you know, Vinod Kozla, um, Google Ventures, you know, they're like, oh, this is fascinating. And what people didn't realize is what their business is, is to place bets. It's like a casino. You know, you win once in a while. And usually if you look at the history of venture capital funds, it's usually one company out of 10 or 15 investments that really moves the needle. And then every decade, there's a company that completely changes the game. And though, you know, we know what those companies are. So there was a lot of bets placed around, and then there was this massive amount of capital saying, let's follow those guys. They look smart. They've made a lot of money in other sectors. But frankly, they didn't know anything about food. Right. And I don't mean to be critical, but they didn't. And there were some missionary, zealous, wonderfully storytelling entrepreneurs who made it sound like we were going to be able to absolutely reinvent food overnight. I, I like to say it takes 15 years to become an overnight success right. in food. So, right. yeah. um, you know, and we've lived through that. You oh, know? yeah. And, Everybody goes, and, yeah, they think you're yeah. really successful. Most of these companies have been successful, been around for 15, 20 years. So if you invest, <laughs> as, as Victor said, you put all this, you know, he called it a war chest, but you put all this money on top of this expectation that the company's going to take off like a rocket ship. Then you have entrepreneurs that necess haven't necessarily built a company in that way. I think Victor's point that John has, and he knows how deliberate and responsibly and complicated and how much time it takes and the people you need, that becomes a disproportionate asset now in a small company. And we're just reaching this point where we have the opportunity for people like John and others to repeat if yeah, have the energy. Yeah, which is cool. <laughs> I, I yeah. think the successful companies, you know, in the food space, you know, in the next couple of years, and you know, you know, Alpha Labs is really, you know, is driving, you know, uh, their concept is, if you're a big food company, you got a lot of dollars on the balance sheet. You know, there's going to be a lot of purchases of companies, and I, I call it a halo period. The next five years, um, and so if you can. And I think before, you know, these last couple of years, you had to be a hundred million dollar company. You had to have like, you know, 10 million in EBITDA. You know, there was like all of these, you know, check marks that you had to do for it to be an acquisition. Now I think the large food companies are, you know, realize that M&A is a big part of their, you know, sort of long term strategy. So that number keeps coming down. I mean, 100 million, 70 million, 50 million, million, 20 million. EBITDA, well, it can be positive, it can be, you know, sort of negative. We'll fix that once we, you know, sort of, you know, acquire. So I do think this is kind of a golden period for starting, you know, food companies. If you're an entrepreneur, you know, out there, you know, I'd say 
you know, really put on, you know, the, the gas over the next couple of years, because if you're looking to build companies and then, you know, uh, you know, have returns for your investors and yourselves, this is a really good time. To John's point, the big challenge is what happens after that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how does better food scale, which is your, you know, right. sort of, you know, question. Um, and we've said that it has to do with culture, that has to do with, you know, sort of, you know, incentives. Um, but ultimately, the consumers are voting with their, you know, sort of, you know, pocketbooks. And investors like SGG and a lot of other investors are coming in and saying, you know, we're going to place our bets, you know, to say, you know, you know, these changes are happening fast, and you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to take a. Historically, I mean, if you listen to an earnings call of a big food company, they will focus on their billion-dollar brands. You listen to the Pepsi call, they'll tell you we have 18. One billion or larger brands in right. our portfolio. So then you look and you say, okay, they bought Izzy, they bought Stacy's Pita Chips, they bought Naked Juice. Um, you look to other portfolios, whether it be Kashi or Stonyfield. Um, these companies did not scale to that billion. As far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong. There's not there's not been an acquisition that was made at you know either a hundred million or even a couple hundred million that has scaled to that level of importance and contribution in those big food companies. And as a matter of fact, many have been really disappointing. So is yeah. the era of the, the billion dollar brand over? So the story sounds good. Right. I mean, will there be another, is that, yeah. and maybe this can go a little bit to our Amazon Whole Foods question yeah. here, but I mean, maybe because of e-commerce, because of challenger brands, because mm -hmm. of customization, I mean, will there be another brand that can really hit that billion dollar market. It won't be the, I don't think it'll be the driver of right. the business. You I think not, you may have one, right. but that's not going to be the it, driver. It will the drive, probably be Amazon's house brand that we don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think um, what you'll see differentiating in the big CPG companies is the ones that have really figured out how to, how to build culture, retain people, set the right incentive structure, and and build up a, a portfolio of brands that are really doing an incredible job staying at the front end. I think Mills is as, as far ahead as anybody on yeah. that. I mean, we bought Epic about 18 months ago. That business is rocking. Culture is incredible. They're innovating like crazy. But you, how do you do that and continue to maintain it over time? It's, it's challenging, but I think that there will be a few that figure it out. Campbell's could be one, too. I mean, the ones who are But the coherence of those brands is really yes. important because, yeah. like, you look at Pepsi. It's really interesting. They have something called the Global Nutrition Group. And those people are really focused on, you know, healthier for you, you know, than they have soda. And, you know, if, you're, if you work at Pepsi, you have to do this rotation where, you know, all of a sudden you're mission-driven and then you've got to go work for Frito-Lay. It's pretty, you know, schizophrenic. And similarly, like, like Unilever has been um, divesting of the companies that they don't think fit that sustainable living model. So they sold Skippy, right. but Hormel bought Skippy. You know, so it's not like it went away. It's just in somebody else's mission set. Bit, so right. I just think your point is that that culture, that culture piece in the umbrella organization is going to be as important yeah. as it is at the company level. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt about it. And I, th I think for for those of us, and I'm sure most people in this room, like the idea that food companies and brands can really be at the forefront of driving positive social environmental change and positive impact. We, you got to root for the big food companies to get this right. Because not only will it help feed an ecosystem of entrepreneurship, provide opportunities for capital to get returns and all that stuff, but it, but it sets the, these companies up potentially to really scale and drive big positive impact. But yeah, my thesis. That's really exciting. The to thesis at S two G, I think at the beginning was, f big food companies are part of the solution. You cannot look at you know sort of change in food without them being part of it, whether it's big food, big ag, or sort of big retail. And so what they've done is optimized convenience, affordability, um, and abundance. Basically, you can get anything, anytime, anywhere, you know, and, you know, that's what they do wonderfully. I mean, they actually have, over the last 70 years, perfected that idea. Well, now you have the consumer wanting a completely different set of values and drivers around authenticity, around flavor, you know, around traceability, around personalization. Those two things have to marry in the middle, and entrepreneurs and I think capital 
are the mechanisms to bring those two, you know, sort of groups, you know, together. And I think that is the future of food, but I don't think it's a billion dollar brand. Another way to put that would be to think about the power of the eater making a conscious choice about what they're doing. And then think about you as an investor, maybe most of the people who can afford to come to a conference like this have a retirement account, an IRA or some managed portfolio. Think about how your capital, your savings, is being used in the world and where it's being spent. So I actually think this is the next frontier of connecting the product that we eat and, um, to our values of our money. Our money is a source of energy, and then the food that we're eating is a source of energy. If we could actually become very mindful and, and make those choices easy to make, then you could have a movement of um, great proportion. One story which isn't sort of related, but it's funny, so I'll tell it, you know, sort of anyway. You have it's 10 like, seconds. Um, so there was a, uh, <laughs> we had a pitch for a company at S2G in the, you know, kind of the early, you know, days, and it was these ex-big food executives who decided they'd had enough, and they kind of wanted to start, you know, their own, you know, sort of healthier for you, you know, brand. So they came in, you know, they had the slide deck, you know, they had, you know, obviously their, you know, their pitch down. And the pitch started, and you know they're really talking about how authenticity is the main driver for consumer purchases, and you know, uh, and so I'm looking at them and I'm trying to listen to them. And you know, they were you know 25 year veterans of the you know sort of the big food uh, business, and both of them they weren't brothers. They were you know you know they had been at uh, the food company for a number of years, and they're talking about authenticity. And they're both there with two pays. And I'm like, you're talking about authenticity as like the main driver. And all I was fixed on was their two pays, like the entire, you know, pitch. And I was like, I don't think I heard another word of the pitch, you know, right. after that. But. I think that is the great takeaway. Do not wear a two pay for pitch meeting. Bad idea. So excellent. Well, thanks, guys. This has been really great panel. So. Thank you. All right, how's everybody doing? Are you feeling enlightened? Are you feeling inspired? Does anybody need to stretch? Okay, so next is gonna be Greg Sprague. Um, this is gonna be really cool. Uh, Greg um, will tell you more, but he's an insider who has held some really high level positions at like Walmart and Sam's Club, and he is doing a lot of things with Solve for Food that are gonna make my life easier as a product developer to get around the ass backward route that a lot of food products have to take to travel to market. So, Greg. Thank you. Good morning. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, listening to all these messages from so many brilliant folks over the last couple of days has been reinforcing for Solve for Food that we're kinda in the path of what's going to happen in the food industry as we move forward, and so we're just thrilled to be here. Um, we've been hearing an awful lot over the last couple of days about technology and food, and this segment we're gonna put a little more flesh on that bone. Uh, we're gonna start with um, Matthew Lang, who is a PhD. He is well-versed in food, biological and health sciences, as well as cutting-edge food, beverage, information, and educational technologies. Matt guides teams towards designing and implementing knowledge and environments that enable end users to make and new and insightful discoveries, create new products, and improve human, human living conditions. Please welcome Matthew Lang. Hi, y'all. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate uh, being here at the CIA. The food last night was absolutely wonderful. Oh, good, we're up. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about uh, what's happening in the world of food and the world of technology and how they're coming together, uh, essentially to create an internet of food. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of the internet of things, uh, where your thermostat's wired, your uh, what, whatever is wired, everything's wired. And, um, and now we, we, we seek to wire up food. Uh, but don't worry, we're not gonna be uh, putting uh, any kind of hardware in your food when you eat it. 
It's actually much more about language. But the crux is, is that it's all about building decision support systems from environment, ag, food, diet, health. So all the way across uh, the entire spectrum of how we deal with food, this is our desire, is to build a language across this. So um, it's a common language and a common infrastructure that we can operate over food with, right? And enable companies to create platforms, ecosystems of technologies for operating on this data. So a lot of you have probably seen this, especially the execs uh, in, in the audience, you know, world's largest company owns no vehicles, world's largest, uh, most subscribed media company, creates its own, no content of its own, biggest accommodation provider, owns no real estate, most valuable retailer, has no inventory. Well, what about the world's largest food company? Are they gonna be disrupted by technology companies? What about the world's largest food purveyance companies? Are they going to be disrupted? What's gonna happen with the Internet of Food? Things are changing, right? And, and we hope so. We want to improve the global food supply. We want to make it so that people are competing, right? We wanna engineer essentially an internet, which has already happened with the broader internet, to an, but to enable companies to compete, to be more traceable, to compete, to be more transparent, and ultimately to compete to deliver more trustworthy food, food that's more sustainably produced, food that's healthier, and of course, tastier. Uh, as many of the speakers have mentioned, that is always the driving force. Um, so, we, I mentioned that building a language is, is essentially the most important part. And those of you um, who may have some background in food science have probably seen the wine wheels, or the beer wheels, or the chocolate wheels, or the coffee wheels. Our perspective is we need to stop recreating the wheel, literally, <laughs> literally. There's no reason that we can't take all of the words that we use around flavor and taste. In fact, there was a question uh, yesterday posed about um, uh, uh, whether folks were building uh, taste and flavor vocabulary, so I can tell you that we're doing it with our partners. We're not building this language alone, by the way, and I'll, I'll mention a little bit about who our partners are uh, in just a few moments. Uh, more wheels, more wheels. So, um, so that's essentially inside the kitchen, inside the food. But we also need to be thinking, when we're thinking of building an Internet of Food, thinking outside of the kitchen, right? So uh, what, what about food outside of the kitchen? Well, so we're building these ontologies, these structured vocabularies that describe domains of interest that can act as channels of information. So this is an ontology made from industry classifications around uh, farming and food production. We also have uh, classifications, ontologies around essentially food processing industry, uh, manufacturing elements. And now the question is, well, how do we take those vocabularies about flavors, about textures, what have you, and align those with then um, specific processing, uh, machinery, right? Also align how much energy does that machine take uh, uh, to run a process? What are the outputs of that machine or industry, right? What are the effluents uh, from the food processing? And can those effluents then be cycled back and used as ingredient streams for yet another. So the Internet of Food has broad implications for building up the circular bioeconomy as well. Um, now, uh, we had uh, Tim Berners-Lee uh, invent the World Wide Web in 1989, totally changed things. Hypertext markup language describes a way to link text uh, across URLs. So the definitions that I was showing you and those ontologies are all based on what are called URIs. These are uniform resource indicators. These are where you can find definitions for terms and enable language to itself become computable. So the question then is, what about a hyperfood markup language? How do we mark up food to make it computable across environment, ag, food, diet, health? A big part of that is gonna be marking up food for its phenotype. We often hear about our phenotypes as people, 
but or plants, right, and hair color, eye color, what have you, maybe how we respond to a glucose challenge test or how we respond to a fat bolus. These are some of the cutting edge things that we're doing with nutritional genomics and nutritional phenotyping, metabolic phenotyping. But we can also phenotype a lasagna, right? We can phenotype a burger. We can phenotype meat. We just need to develop vocabularies around that. In fact, we can phenotype all across the food system from the land where farmers are growing, how to decide what to grow, when to grow, when to harvest, plants. And, and, and in this case, uh, this is a, a, a large uh, grain manufacturer we're working with. Phenotyping flour. How does it flow? What are the characteristics of the flour? Phenotyping dough. I'm so excited to phenotype dough. Dough is the coolest stuff in the world. It's one of the most complex materials on the planet. It's alive, it's heterogeneous. How do we phenotype dough? Well, we can, how fast does it rise? How fast does it respond to elastic challenges? Things like this. And then, of course, how does that translate into uh, actual food products? And what would the best product be to make from a specific type of dough? And we're doing crazy things like uh, MRI of bread, CAT scans, down to the molecular level. So really, if we talk about food phenotyping, we're actually talking about four root classes of vocabulary terms, uh, prop, physical properties, chemical components and properties, biological components, and of course, for flavor and aroma, organoleptic properties. And how that last section there, how does that get derived from the three previous uh, classifications? And dynamically, how does that change through processing flows? Right? So we have an ontology of food processing that, of course, would be linked to uh, the machinery uh, and, and, and ontologies of sensory experience. Oh, my clicker is... Okay, there we go. And a lot of this is already being captured. It's called Foodon, uh, which is a food ontology uh, of which I'm a co-author. Um, now, I heard you guys... I wasn't here yesterday, but I heard you were talking about weed. And um, I had a... a a, a quick conversation with Ali in the back, and he was mentioning that you were talking about uh, weed in terms of being able to make it taste good. Uh, but I think that marijuana is actually going to change the food industry, uh, especially in California, uh, for a different reason. And that is, we're going to come to expect that food... Um, oh, okay. That uh, we, we're going to come to have different expectations for food. So... Am I going? Okay. Uh, so whereas we might expect deliciousness or flavor, aroma, what have you, um, if you want to be a certified bud tender, you need to know whether that brownie that you just ate is going to enable you to um, write the next great American novel or whether it's going to enable you to be stuck on the couch for the rest of the evening and not do anything. Right? And so... What we actually know is that we can actually modify some of these things uh, by modifying your gut microflora. So we can make you nervous by changing your gut microflora. We can make you feel all different kinds of ways. So foods actually have an impact, but they've had more subtle impact, and we haven't actually realized it. So how do we build a vocabulary around how food is going to make us feel? Right? And some people want to make these vocabularies proprietary. Lots of people have proprietary vocabularies, but I would argue that's a little bit like making musical notes proprietary, right? And, and, and the musical notes themselves are not where the value is. It's in the music. And, you know, I mean, this is just, you know, you can see the top line, every third wave is harmonic. Uh, that actually sounds good, whereas when you play a C and an F sharp together, not so nice, right? And we, we experience the same things with foods, but we don't really have a language like musical notes to actually describe how that works, and be able to compute over it. We can compute over music now. We can make music. Um, and, and, and in fact, you know, the impetus for, for people being able to make their own aromas has actually been around for a while. This is uh, 1970, these guys were around, enabling people to make their own perfumes uh, on Shattuck Avenue in Berkeley. In fact, I have a uh, three-by-five card in the back from the original days uh, where I wrote the recipe for my wife's custom perfume. Uh, called it lavender leather, and um, but now you can order it up online, uh, of course, and and so it's not just about the language. Oh, I'm I'm yellow. Okay, I'm not red yet. 
And uh, it's not just about language, it's about taking that language, associating it with Internet of Things device data, right? Because we can sense things, annotating that data with a common language, and then laying that down in a blockchain record. So if we're talking about how a plant grows, uh, how you raise your animals, how you, um, uh, exp you know, essentially dealt with food through the food chain, uh, we can lay that down in a record. And now we have, if we have a controlled vocabulary and ontology, we can actually compute over that information. Um, we're also enabling other interfaces to happen. Uh, this is one of our startup partners, Ag Voice, um, who's building voice interfaces. Uh, uh, you'll hear from Raja talking about his food browser and Ripe.io. And, um, and these are some of our global partners. We're partnering with uh, um, the uh, Global Information uh, Map of Standards, uh, organized through the FAO, the Global Agricultural Concept Schema, Open Biological Ontologies Consortium. Uh, they build gene and protein ontologies, food on, uh, crop ontology, plant ontology, environment ontology at Max Planck. And, um, and uh, last two slides, uh, this is, Am I still? I'm falling apart. All right. Okay. Uh, is it, are you tackling me now? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, this is just uh, our, so our conference is coming up uh, what, day after, uh, Monday. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, which is why I'm a little flustered. Oh, just as an example of one of our, our panels on computational flavor and defining language. And, um, and if any of you still happen to be in town, we'd love to see you there. So I'll be back out with the rest of them. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I did say brilliance at the beginning of this segment, didn't I? Uh, I learned a lot of new terms uh, and uh, I'm fascinated by the Internet of Food. I think that's a terrific presentation. We're going to follow along with a blockchain discussion. Raja uh, Ramajandran is the founder of Ripe.io a technology company leveraging IoT, sensors, algorithms, and blockchain to help the food supply chain achieve safety, transparency, efficiency, and compliance. Please welcome Raja. Good morning. Um, thanks for letting us uh, present. How many of you know about Bitcoin? Anything about cryptocurrency? You want to buy some? I, I don't have any, so we're not going to go down that path today. We're going to talk a little bit about Blockchain of food. <clears throat> We're using this technology to solve problems. Uh, you know, they're pretty vast in the food supply chain. And this technology is basically the equivalent of when people t looked at CompuServe and you look at the browser today. <clears throat> this is inevitable. It's about to happen. It is a way to share data. It is a way to create records of truth. And we're going to talk a little bit about how. So you've probably seen slides like this, and Matt <laughs> has seen this uh, actually before, but, you know, everyone asks, where's our food come from? So we have no idea who makes our food. <clears throat> and you all sort of like know that, right? And so people ask in restaurants, they ask at grocery stores, they ask at home. <clears throat> and then you're like, well, how did it get to us? What does that magical transportation really mean? You know, it's what happens when it's in, the, uh, in a refrigerated truck or a heated truck or even open air. And of course, what's in it? <clears throat> You're all seeing so many different um, statistics around what's happening at the center of the aisle, right? In terms of packaged food, we've heard from Campbell's yesterday, for example, about how it is that they're diversifying buying companies and looking at like, how do you achieve freshness? How do you achieve truth in food? <clears throat> and so, you know, my background and my team's background is that we are, you know, we've been involved with blockchain for a number of years. Um, but I also come from the financial trading area. I've been a foreign exchange trader. I've managed algorithmic um, trading systems and so on. And so as we got into this, <clears throat> um, we were introduced to our partner, Analog Devices, who created the Internet of Tomatoes project. The Internet of Tomatoes is meant to basically figure out, well, what's a good way to, what's the best way to make a great tomato? So it's a, f a series of understanding the farming, the sensors that they have in the ground, and they also use a spectrometer. And so you get kind of a record of the tomato that says it's salty, it's sweet, it's acidic. So when we looked at the food supply chain, it was amazing because it's so disparate, it's, it's, it's disconnected, and there's so many activities. And I say this all the time, but you know, as an outsider, 
we marvel at the fact that we get food every day and we're not all dead. <laughs> and so in that sense, it's like, it's an amazing thing. So <clears throat> we apply blockchain to it. As you've heard Matt talk a lot about <clears throat> the Internet of Food, we're actually working with his group so that we incorporate their ontologies. So in essence, it's effectively a translator so that when you enter our blockchain, if you use the words sustainability, well, what does it mean? How is it defined? Can I talk to Pepsi as I could the local farmer in Salinas? And does that actually have meaning? So the blockchain of food is really a, a, a decentralized, a distributed database. So you capture all this information from the varying sources, and you allow them to share it. <clears throat> and through that process, you create a record of truth. And that's really the fundamental aspect of what we are. So what do you get? Potentially the quest for a better tomato. So <clears throat> we look at, at food as really a wall of words. You know, in a way, everything that defines food as its organic substance or an ingredient has a descriptor about it. And so what we've done is take elements of those and to describe particular aspects of food. And so that's actually incorporated on our blockchain. And so you've heard Matt talk about ontologies. This is actually a live, real use case of how you implement such a thing. You know, how does cultivar, you know, connect with disease? And, and so on, right? And so from that perspective, this is an element of what we do. So we, our mission is to create transparency in every bite of food. I, you know, I know it's a little schlotzy, but we think that that's a pretty cool way to basically describe it. And what you're seeing is if you break down <clears throat> elements of taste, well, it's a series of words and data that come and describe such a thing or flavor. Same thing with traceability. <clears throat> it's a function of what's the tagging, what is the uh, traceability around it, the geologs, and so on. And so you go through it, you get product histories. And that's really what we aim to achieve. So what's behind all of this? We, uh, people have constantly asked, well, why don't you use the central database? Why don't you, you know, what does it actually do? In the end, <clears throat> blockchain is going to become invisible. It is really a mechanism to share data and create records of truth. You don't go to a browser and go, what is HTML? What is HTTPS? What is FileNet, et cetera? You just want to go to Amazon.com or the site that you're looking at. So in the same sense, <clears throat> blockchain, and I don't want to get too detailed about this, is a function of looking at a web of trust. So what does that mean? First, you actually go through and determine you know, each of the participants in your chain. So this is actually a live... Um, uh, pilot that we did this summer where we basically wired up the farm. <clears throat> we captured a lot of information about cultivar like, and, and started tracking information from the time it was put into a hothouse all the way to uh, until it's actually put into a bin where it gets cut in the restaurant. And we have a record of all that. <clears throat> and so we have a record of quality, uh, of farming curation, of transportation, what actually happens to tomatoes in that entire process. And we can predict Shelf life, ripeness, freshness, <clears throat> quality and taste, that can be all put on the blockchain. And so we are in the process now of expanding that to not only fresh produce, <clears throat> but also manufactured product. So dairy, for example, has its own procedure and how you manage a lot of how your milk and cheese products get to you. We're also doing that for seafood and, <clears throat> and a, an additional level of consumer products goods. So another part of it, <laughs> back to... Uh, Matt's sort of notion of the hyperfood markup language, well, this is it. This is actually a real implementation of such a thing. You're seeing a bunch of bits and bytes. All this is is sitting behind a browser, capturing information from a blockchain so that you can actually use it in a way that's meaningful to you. And so it looks like this. <clears throat> he showed a, a picture of that before, and we call this our food browser. And what you're seeing here is an analytic framework in which you can actually look at all of your produce. So in this instance, this is a restaurant, supply chain manager, operations manager, etc. And they are able to, to look at it and go, <clears throat> okay, great. Sun, sun gold uh, cherry tomatoes, how much was in a particular lot? Uh, what was this harvest date? <clears throat> Things like quality score can be achieved. These are just merely mathematical representations of what quality means. And then you've got taste profiles. And then also you've got <clears throat> information about the farm. Like I said, we capture something like 125 variables from the farm, including, you know, uh, NPK, 
how much water they use, what's the lab analysis of the soil, what's this regeneration process, do they burn it, and on and on. These farmers were really good about providing us information. The bottom is traceability. <clears throat> Once you get an ecosystem put into place, you can actually see what, what occurs during that process. And so you can create alerts. You see a red that basically says, you know, something, it fell below a temperature threshold. It could be, it could be affecting that particular tomato set. <clears throat> so this is, <laughs> this is actually going to go live next week, and our customer, and we are going to be in a Bloomberg article, so <laughs> look for it when you see it. They want to actually do this. They want to basically represent and show to their customers where'd that food come from. So if you've got a menu component and a picture, you can actually break out and use on mobile and websites the ability to go ahead and see where your food came from, who made it, how did it get there. And so um, I'm probably going to end a little bit early, but in essence, the blockchain of food <clears throat> is really meant to represent you know, an amalgamation of the data that represents the food plus its workflow. That's really important because, as, you, as I said in the very first slide, that workflow is very hard to codify because it's so variant, you know, depending on whether it's seafood, proteins, almonds, milk, whatever it might be. So in that sense, as we continue to grow, this is an open source network of folks that you can you know, enter and create your own applications. We were just uh, cited with, uh, with Rob's company <clears throat> in a Forbes article. We had... We, I think we've got something like 650 inbound emails from all walks of life globally about how do I use this. So the interest is there. It's less about the technology as opposed to the imagination and the wanting of better, safe food. Thank you for your attention. So uh, transparency, traceability, predictability, all themes in this conference, and um, looks like there's an answer. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Catherine Rowe. She's the Vice President of National Client Partnerships at Oracle Data Cloud. Catherine leads Oracle Data Cloud's go-to-market practice for consumer packaged goods. Her team uh, works with the largest advertisers in the media space, driving brand success through best-in-class data-driven targeting measurement and custom solutions. Prior to Oracle, Catherine uh, spent six years at Google focused on CPG client partnerships. She was also uh, the brand and category marketing initiatives leader at Pepperidge Farm. Please welcome Catherine. Thank you, Greg. You guys hear me okay? Awesome. Good morning. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit from some of the other things we've talked about and talk about big data and uh, how we leverage that from a consumer standpoint. So the convergence of data and food, which is something I'm very passionate about. I think they go really well together, quite honestly. And so just a little bit more about Oracle Data Cloud. What we do is we were an actually, actually an acquisition from Oracle about a year and a half ago. We were a startup data company based out of uh, Boulder, Colorado. And then big Oracle bought us and they said, what do we do with the data company? Oh, I know, we create data as a service. And so that's what our division does at Oracle. So my job and my team's job, we work with large CPG manufacturers. And what we do is we uh, compile data and then we leverage that data across 115 million households within the United States. So think about the vast majority of households that we have information on. And this data comes from loyalty cards, obviously privatized, right? But it's everything from Pottery Barn to Safeway to um, uh, Joe's Fleet and Farm. All this data that gets us down to household level, address, uh, email, et cetera, so that we can leverage that data to make better decisions and help with insights for our marketers. So from our standpoint, what we do with this data is we help our marketers, so think Campbell Soup, Chobani, et cetera, define who is my actual buyer. So we believe that past purchase behavior is more indicative of future purchase behavior than any of the other insights that are out there. We also work with these marketers to activate. So think, how do I take that defined audience and then find them on Facebook or on Google or across the web on other websites. And then lastly, we do what we call closed loop measurement to say, if she saw that Annie's ad on Facebook, did she actually go into a store and buy that? So said another way, if I'm a yogurt company and I've got, 
let's say, a, a new yogurt that's sweet and healthy, but not too chunky, so I want to market to kids. The, the easiest thing to do, right, would be to go after women, say, 18 to 54. Well, they could look very different, right? And she may or may not buy yogurt. But with the power of data, now I can actually know what car she drives. Does she shop at Whole Foods? Does she also shop at Safeway? Maybe she does produce at Whole Foods, but more of her day-to-day -day shopping at Safeway. She likes healthy foods, but she also shops Pottery Barn and Gap Kids. Okay, good indicator there that she's actually got kids. Likes healthy food, but at the same time, loves that indulgence of ice cream once in a while. And then lastly, most importantly, she actually buys yogurt and kids yogurt. So this is a really good target for this yogurt company to look at. And the beauty of data science is that we have this, what we call a seed of a yogurt buyer. And then with data science, we can model based on all these other attributes to find other people just like her who are a great market for this yogurt company. And the beauty of that, because of everything we've heard this week, is that uh, marketing is tight, consumers are fickle, they're not loyal, everything is moving so quickly, how do we make our marketing dollars work harder? So we've seen some of this already, so I'll go, I'll go through this fairly quickly, but what's changed so much in the last call it five to 10 years, is uh, multi-generational uh, multi households, a new definition of families, millennials, we've talked about that ad nauseum, and then men as buyers, right? So 61 million Americans live in multi-generational households. So that's a whole different marketing challenge, right? Because the same household is buying a variety of different products. And we've seen ads like the Tide Pod ad that speaks to this. 150x, 150, 150 times, anybody knows what this is? The amount of time the average millennial checks their cell phone, right? And that's important, why? Because data is right here at our fingertips, constantly. Millennials spend more than boomers. So, I mean, I, this is a little bit controversial for me because I feel so many of my advertisers are so focused on millennials that they lose sight of who is actually buying their product. So it goes both ways, but it is very important and they shop differently. We've talked a lot about this. They're health focused, they're fickle, they're not brand loyal, private label. They want healthier options, they read labels. They don't want labels that have ingredients that they don't know what it is. And the man factor, 43% of men are the primary grocery shopper. Yes, most of my marketers, most of my CPG companies target women. We've got to think differently about who's actually buying our products because men are less price sensitive. They buy more meat and alcohol. They, uh, of course, duh. Um, God forbid use a shopping list. And they over-index in club and convenience stores. You know, so not mind-numbing, but important for what you're marketing to. So data is insights. We saw this earlier in the week, 65%, and I've actually seen that number higher depending on who you talk to and what survey, but products fail. So all the more importance of having and leveraging data that's available today to truly understand your target market. So I'm gonna give three examples here of how I've worked with clients to leverage data. So we worked with an upscale tea company. I'm not able to use the name, obviously, but an upscale tea company who said, you know, we would love to find out more about who's actually buying our product because it's, it, we've been in market two years, we're doing well, but we're not hitting forecasts. And so we'd just love to find out a little bit more about who our target market is, or who is actually buying our product, I should say. And we said, okay, who are you actually targeting? They said, well, we feel that this is an upscale tea, light caffeine for a pick-me-up for that mom when she finally has a moment to herself and that zen type of, of moment. So this is the mom, so this, this isn't the actual creative, but this is what they were going after, right? And then this is her in the afternoon, reading a book in a hammock, <laughs> sipping our tea. Okay, I've never seen that mom before, but cool. <laughs> okay, so then we dug into the data, who's actually their, their uh, consumer? Guess what? They had it right with mom, but it's the working mom who's checking in on the kids to make sure that they got home from school. It's the frazzled mom who's picking up the kids from, from school and uh, taking them to the next soccer practice. And it's the work from home mom. And what it is, is they've already had their caffeine or their Red Bull light. They just need a little pick me up in the afternoon with a little light caffeine. 
Okay, do you think any of these women want to be marketed to in the Zen hammock? No. So those insights allowed them to change up their creative and who they're marketing to. Another example, my favorite topics, wine. Did you know that the average, this was from insights from our data, I'm working with a wine company, the average um, heavy wine consumer spends 40 times what a light wine consumer spends. And that's much higher than any other CPG. You don't find that in Annie's mac and cheese or Kraft mac and cheese or soup or anything. It's just wine consumption. If you're in it, you're in it to win it. So we, so we worked with this wine company who said, our wine consumer is the Tuesday wine club, the book club gals, right? That's who we're marketing to. Dug in the day, let's see, the, and the data shows your consumer is actually skews more male. And guess what? He only buys you on average once a year, meaning you've got to stay on his radar. And it skews a little bit higher than what you thought, right? So again, changing who they're marketing to. Last example, I'm going to be on time. Um, last example, we worked with a yogurt company. And super excited that they had happened to miss a specific yogurt trend, but they were back on track and they were going to do this one right. And so they want, what they wanted to find out was, um, this new, it was a new product launch. So this is the first time we'd done this, where they, the product had actually launched. And so we went into the data and we said, okay, who is that brand champion, that target market? And they said, we're actually going with a little bit of a European. It's definitely female. You know, she's definitely 24 to 35, a little bit more upscale, a little more affluent. But she's got this European flair, whether she's actually European or whatever, and the good, serious, you know, so that was kind of the flavor of the advertising. Now, the good news for this company is when we went in six weeks later, we found that, yes, they actually were marketing to the right uh, demographic, not only demographic, but just the right overall person of who was purchasing. So the people that were purchasing that yogurt in targeting that we've built for them actually was working. And it was a great insight. The bigger problem was they couldn't keep up with the, the supply chain. So there was more demand, you know, which is a good problem to have when you have a new product launch. So in conclusion, that's, we just think that data makes food better, and it's just another way of thinking overall about data. And that is my Twitter handle there. So thank you very much. I don't want to take this. Oh, don't take that. People right. don't like Somebody that. Somebody else doesn't need that. Right. Yeah. So I wanted to be offended by her description of the male shopper. Then I realized she nailed me perfectly. Um, <laughs> I, I, and, I, and I love that presentation, having been a merchant and a, and a marketer for a number of years and realizing that being able to market and use your dollars effectively to, 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 um, a, you know, to address the appropriate market is, is paramount. Um, our next speaker is Rob Trice. He's the founder of The Mixing Ball and Better Food Ventures. Based in Silicon Valley, he is leveraging his experience in mobile, internet, and telecom venture capital to pursue application of innovation in information technology and food and agricultural challenges. The Mixing Bowl is a forum to link food, agriculture, and IT innovators. Better Food Ventures makes investments into startups that are harnessing the power of information and communications technology to improve food and agriculture. Please welcome Rob. Thank you, and I'm pleased to be here uh, in part because I think my, my commentary is going to be very complimentary to the other uh, uh, the speakers and we're gonna have a fun panel discussion. Um, I want to give a little bit of background. So uh, as you heard, I was in uh, mobile internet and telecom venture capital for 15 years. Five years ago, my wife started running a cattle ranch out in Pescadero, California. And uh, four years ago, she dragged me to Danielle Gould's Hack Meet Silicon Valley Hackathon at the Stanford D School. And um, it was a weird mix of 200 people or so ranchers and butchers and chefs and all of this and um, we won and uh, my parents who happened to be here were shocked when I told them hey mom and dad I'm on the cover of modern farmer magazine <laughs> just something that we they never thought they would hear from me but it caused me to step back and look at the fact that um, food and ag is 10% of the world's economy and on that ranch there was no technology being used amongst the local food producers in Pescadero very little technology being used and then looking back at Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley's IT innovation ecosystem was not focused on the food and challenges 
the, the challenges of food and agriculture four or five years ago. So I created the mixing bowl to connect IT, food, and ag innovators. How can we bring the people that are changing the world with IT innovation together who, with the people that are feeding the world? We have three elements to what we're doing. Information sharing, advising, and funding. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. I have three fantastic partners um, who are on this journey with me. One is a guy named Michael Rose, who I worked with at SK Telecom about seven years ago. I did not know at that time that the first 10 years of his life was in the restaurant business. Shauna Day, I've actually met in 2005, when she was a mobile investment banker. She's from Turlock, California. She re relocated back there, saw this intersection of agriculture and technology, her two loves, and started really looking at ag tech as it is. And Britta Rosenheim, who's based in New York, many of you know, who's been um, in uh, food, CPG, food media, food tech, investment banking for 15 years. And on our information sharing, you heard that we write for Forbes.com on food tech and ag tech. Um, Britta puts together a, a food tech and media landscape map. She tracks over 2,000 companies. Shauna does the same thing on ag tech. She's tracking over 1,500 companies. Um, on the investment side for Better Food Ventures, uh, we've invested in 12 companies uh, at the seed stage in three years. I'm happy to tell you more about these. One is a company called NEMA. That's a pocket-sized gluten detection device that's extendable also to other proteins like shellfish and peanuts. It's dropping the price and the time of testing from uh, $20 and 20 minutes to $2 and 2 minutes. Um, another company here is Adaptin. It's a spin out of Cornell that does cloud-based nitrogen application recommendations for farmers. Uh, if you don't know, uh, the majority of crops in the world do require nitrogen. The average customer using Adaptin is using 30% less nitrogen. Um, and I'll just pick out another one here, which is Vinsight, which is using machine learning to do yield prediction for uh, wine grapes and for almonds. Um, as you well know, this audience well knows, food and agriculture challenges span the value chain from production, processing, transport, and sales. It's massive. It's global. Consumer preferences are changing quite quickly. We have incredible new technologies that we need to bring to this market responsibly. Um, and there are disastrous consequences of doing nothing or getting it wrong. As I said, I came from the IT world. Um, I will tell you that tweeting and eating are quite different. Um, if you have a software um, update for an application, the application might crash. You send out a bad food product, someone can die. So one of the things with my investor perspective is I don't care about feeding 9 billion people by 2050. I'm going to be 83 years old in 2050. I think that's a false design challenge. Rather, I want to look at how can we use IT to inject more agility, precision, personalization, transparency into food and agriculture now, so that by the time we reach 2050, we're going to have a plethora of options to address that shortage of food that we're expecting. IT is the key enabler that's going to enable new forms of monetization, incentives, and distribution. I'm going to get a little bit wonky here, but I'm going to do it very quickly uh, because I want my panelists to come out. In 1995, this guy, Clayton Christensen, writes this book called Disruptive Innovation. He basically talks about, let's just take books. We all used to grow up and we go to the bookstore. Then somebody comes out with a value proposition that makes absolutely no sense, like buying books online, but they have a lower cost of operations. Let's call that company Amazon. What happens over time? They go and they disrupt that industry. The only point that I'm trying to make here is that since 1995 to 2017, these disruptors are getting more and more access to IT technologies like, like cloud-based services, um, open source, do-it-yourself, social marketing, online sales. The net effect is for a, as Ben Horowitz or Andreessen Horowitz, the VC firm says, the cost of running a web startup has fallen 100x in the last 11 years. He said that in 2011. So you can just imagine that cost curve is just coming down more and more. I think that this disruption is giving rise to an era of continuous volatility. The U.S. military has a term called VUCA, where you assume in your operating environment volatility, uncertainty, complexity, complexity and ambiguity. My whole point is that we're, move, we're moving into a world that is a VUCA world. And the question is, how do you survive in a VUCA world? And the, the response is agility. Uh, Nassim Taleb calls it anti-fragility. I don't like that term. I think that you can, though, design systems so that they actually gain from volatility. And the way that you do that is you accept complexity and disorder in your decision-making. 
you just um, you distribute decision making, risk taking, reward sharing. You see that small actually can be more efficient than large because large could become brittle. And you learn from trial and error where there are small failure costs, but potentially large wins. This is what I'm seeing in Silicon Valley right now. I'm seeing hummingbirds and brontosauruses. A hummingbird uh, is like a startup, it running around, flitting around, trying to find food or money to stay alive. They have a high mortality rate, an average lifespan of three to five years. But this is actually the Peruvian hummingbird that can grow to be 23 centimeters long and still stay really fast. On the other hand, is a brontosaurus, like a big food company. So it's got a big body, a small brain. <laughs> it sits in the swamp and chews grass all day. It can live to be 100 years old, but if it doesn't adapt to its environment, it dies off. So how do you embrace volatility? You probably heard a little bit about this from some, somebody like Matt. Roth looking at the agile enterprise. How do you actually start with a minimal viable product and you test, A, B test continuously to go figure things out and then ultimately take all of that development and roll that into your operations. I was an investor in a company called School Feed a couple years back that went from zero to 22 million users. What they basically did is took your high school yearbook and brought that online using the Facebook platform. They made 40 product changes a day. So they would put buttons out there and do an A, B test with a pink button and a blue button, see that the pink button would get a higher click rate and make all the buttons pink. And they're continuously iterating, iterating that way. Facebook does the same thing with about 1% of the news feeds. My whole point is now what's happening, we're seeing fast, cheap, abundant computing processes that's taking what school feed was doing and they're automating it. And so we've got all these buzzwords related to artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and so forth. The net effect is you're taking that agility and that A-B testing, and you're throwing it into an automated platform. And it's giving rise to an incredibly powerful platform like Facebook, Amazon, Uber, and Google. This is just some examples um, in food and agriculture. I'm going to cut short uh, a lot of these, um, but I will talk about Artis, Artis Coffee, which on its surface may just look like a hipster coffee shop in San Francisco. They're doing small batch on-site real-time roasting. The, the net effect of being able to do that is what Thrive is enabling is that the, the supply chain is changing. Where let's just take a Costa Rican coffee producer, no longer has to go through a bulk export importer, a bulk grocer, a bulk shipper, wholesale, and customer. Now I can walk in and have a direct relationship through information technology, maybe through Facebook, with that Costa Rican coffee producer and get a small batch using third-party logistics directly delivered to Artis and they can roast those beans for me on site. One of the things I want to make sure that we understand is that there is a, a staircase for food and ag tech innovation. And one of the things that concerns me right now is that a lot of the money that's going into innovation for food and agriculture is looking at automation and robots. The reality is we got to crawl before we walk, before we run. Whether it's in a restaurant or it's on a farm, we need to digitize, manage information, iterate, optimize, then we can automate. And there's no shortcuts that we can really take. We've got to get that data, be able to uh, uh, manage it and then iterate it. And one of the things, uh, I'm going to skip that one, is we're exploring at the, the mixing bowl is where are we in developing the full stack in food and agriculture. I'm not talking about a full stack of pancakes. I'm not talking about a full stack of hay. What I'm talking about is the full stack of the digitization of food and agriculture. Uh, agriculture. We've decided to make this our theme for 2018. We do two events, one in New York that we'll do with Forbes in March, the other one right before the Forbes Ag Tech event here in San Francisco. And that's our theme, the full stack. Where are we? If you take the full stack model, which is software geeks use, which is the OSI model, there's seven layers. And there's the physical layer, there's the data exchange layer, the security layer, application layer, user interface layer. All of that can be transported and we can really assess where are we in terms of digitizing food and agriculture. And that's all I've got. Thank you. I'm going to ask each one of our speakers to come out. Um, we're going to have a panel here um, that will take your questions. Um, so if you'd open up Slido and, and post a few, I'm going to, I'll see a couple of questions for you folks and then uh, let you kind of take it off of the, uh, the Slido. Um, Catherine, let's start with you. Um, so you've been in marketing for a while. Uh, you've seen a, a gradual adoption of technology mm -hmm. in marketing. 
Uh, what are you seeing now that is, that's, that's either adopted or being adopted more broadly? Well, I think, can you guys hear me? Okay. I, I think the, again, I come from the, the lens of data. Um, what I'm seeing is it's forcing big companies this co in, instant gratification, constantly on my phone, n information at my fingertips is forcing big companies to react more quickly, to be more agile, be more flexible. And oh, by the way, it's spurred startups who can be more flexible, fast, and agile. And, and I'll use an example from my, my Pepperidge Farm days. So it was a few years ago, but it's still really relevant. We had an insight from data that said, um, Women still wanted an indulgent, uh, an indulgent sweet treat, but at the same time they were busier than ever and spending more time in their car than ever. And so from that insight, we designed, marketing designed, a new cookie that was going to be the next Milano, right? And it was a sweet, portable, poppable cookie that could fit in a cup holder, right? It's brilliant. Okay, fast forward 18 months and new production line to develop this sweet, portable, poppable cookie that could fit in a cup holder, the trends had changed and low carb was in and low sugar. And when that product launched, I was so proud. I had end caps in every Target store. And that Monday morning, I realized, wow, it's not selling. We took more product off the shelf than we actually sold because women no longer wanted to chug cookies on their way to work. Because we, we missed the trend. So right, my, my point right. is, is that the data and the insights are pushing companies to move more quickly as the trends change yeah, more good. quickly. And, it, and are you seeing that fairly broadly adopted? or? A lot it of depends on the company. Care. It, it yeah. really does. Some are move, moving faster than others. Yeah. We saw you know, great examples. Um, John today talked about Annie's. Right. And I applaud General Mills. They brought Annie's in and said, let's not ruin it. Yeah. Let's you know, keep it more of the big companies as we acquire companies sure. are keeping them autonomous. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Kashi was another one that Kellogg's acquired. For the most part, they kept it autonomous so that they didn't lose that authenticity. That, that's that always the it. trick, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Matt, I've got a question for you. Uh, before we see digital ubiquity in food, we need to put some of the plumbing in place, I think. How do you compare the Internet of Food to the development of the Internet of Other Verticals? So, um, can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Great. But I'm uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, the first thing I think, you know, uh, we need language, and, but, 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 but food is really complicated. Mm -hmm. And so it's not enough to say, so, so it, was kind of, it was kind of a ruse to say hyperfood markup language because that's kind of a catch-all and, and that doesn't really get at the complexity. Um, <clears throat> so there's this, you know, issue of we need um, f uh, governments, uh, NGOs, and corporations uh, to essentially come forward with the language that they're using to describe food itself, right. and um, and and this you, you know uh, if you're a flavor company you know look you know you've been holding on to your flavor vocabularies for a long time because right. they're proprietary and yep. um, and 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 I think now people are starting to realize oh my gosh there's an opportunity for us to actually set an international standard here. If yeah. I've got you know 50,000 terms or 100,000 terms sure. to describe a specific domain, yeah. um, and if I open that up, right. I have the opportunity to not only set an international standard and wrap branding around that, but also to um, to essentially already have my data systems pipelined into that international standard. So it will mm -hmm. require a lot less development. Sure. And and in that way, I think that's that's how we're sort of you know. Pulling in people to to build out this this plumbing, this sure. language plumbing, it's not going to be the same as hardware type. Um, and I think Rob's probably got an opinion on this because he's got the background in telecom. Um, but it's not going to be the same as the the plumbing, the hardware plumbing, as it were. Uh, I mean, there are some sensors that need to, are being built, of course. Um, but but it, from my perspective, the the language is is really Just key. Yeah, I, I mean, I, as Matt says, I came from a telecom world, and I was trying to do the mobile internet in 2001. It was way too early. So, so you think about those machines, and we had a WAP browser. Maybe you had a Symbian operating system that, you know, just to put an application together cost maybe $75,000, right? Maybe you're on a 2.5 GPRS network. 
come on, the conditions weren't right. And that's where we are with food and agriculture, which is it's those annoying days when you couldn't get a Word doc to open on an Apple computer. Yeah. You couldn't share a calendar invite. You couldn't share a contact. That's where we are in food and agriculture. A lot of the, the, the solutions that have been built are proprietary. Yeah. So I think there's just two things that we need to take from looking at other industries. One is exactly the, the work that Matt's doing at IC Foods, which is that top-down data standardization. The other thing is bottoms up and creating the Internet of Tomatoes, things where we're actually seeing the value chain come together. We're seeing the benefit of, of collaboration, sharing the information. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite ones is Beer XML. Mm -hmm. So the craft brew, brewing industry, who is always cutting edge, uh, got together and created this Beer XML. And so if, if Roger's got a great Pilsner uh, uh, recipe and I've got a Beer XML compliant home brewer, uh, I can load up the ingredients, and that's going to brew Raj's Pilsner on my machine remotely. Yeah. That's what we need to see is those right. kind of examples, and that's a very mm -hmm. important um, yeah. example, I think, yeah, I get it. I get it. So, uh, Raj, blockchain is going to play a role here. Um, I guess one of the questions is, are we, are we putting too much emphasis on the value of blockchain on the short term, and are we um, not really seeing the long-term value of blockchain? So I don't think we're emphasizing blockchain. I mean, it's so early. I don't think most people even know what it is. Yeah. You know, and it's hard to describe because it's a network technology. And, um, and so from that perspective, the activity around exploring blockchain is immense. I come from the financial world, and my company was a financial consortium of now it's up to 95 banks, right? So that's there. Ethereum has a foundation that has 100 you know, large corporations that are part of it. You know, Bitcoin is expanding rapidly, <clears throat> and Hyperledger is an IBM, you know, effect. So you've got about, about, you know, like 500 companies globally, worldwide, that are actually looking at this, right? Mm -hmm. So the issue then becomes, well, how do you really use it? Because in the end, technology, right, it's just another tool in the shed. So I think that the long run, if you get longitudinal records of food, right, I think somebody's asking about how far can you go back. Well, it can go back as far as you imagine food. <clears throat> so, and then what does it actually mean as you get the end result? So, in the end, what you're actually looking at is being able to, you know, not only take the data, right, so things like Catherine's involved in with, with clouds, right, because that are going to get immersed into these blockchains, but you have to validate them. And I think that's really where the long run value ultimately is. You know, back to the software question, right, or like this notion of like infrastructure. I mean, you can set up a blockchain for 10 bucks, seriously. It's open source, it's cheap, you know. The, the issue is participant motivation. Why would a farmer share data? Well, they want to sell more stuff. Why does a distribution company at all even think about, you know, breaking their opacity, you know, opaqueness, and showing this? Well, it's because they're actually serving local food companies, and on and on, right? So that's kind of where I think things go, is that, you know, that. As far as data standards, I think what it, there may be an interesting pivot in a few years where artificial intelligence becomes a real piece of the action because you don't need data standards then. Because if you have artificial intelligence, it self-perpetuates its learning. And so if it understands the language of food, you get a very, very different outcome. That's down the road, but I think it'll help. Yeah, good, good. And uh, Rod, um, your organization works along the spectrum of ag tech, right? Um, what, what do you see, and you've addressed this a little bit, what, what else do you see on the horizon in this space and what's going to take from an innovation perspective to get us to the next level? I think exactly that point that I made earlier, which is, you know, we need to see more success cases of yeah. people using this data, particularly in open standards, getting all these proprietary standards out of the way. Part of the challenge I see with a lot of the startups is they built their own proprietary ontology. And there's no way to get these services, products, devices talking to each other. Right. And so if you talk to a farmer, for instance, they all have a soil sensor. They'll have a weather station. There's nothing that pulls that together in a dashboard for them, right. unless they have all John Deere equipment, right, or all Netafim irrigation equipment. Right. And so you still have this loyalty of, to a paint color. That's going to break down. It's very, it's very similar Absolutely. to, you know, um, a Microsoft Office suite. Right. Mm -hmm. That's again like where we are. It's early days in terms of this. Where where we're going with this whole food tech and ag tech on the data side. Yeah. Right. Do you have a comment? Yeah, yeah, actually. Um, this idea that uh, there's a lot of startups building proprietary ontologies. And, you know, 
Ontologies are special beasts because they're, they're vocabularies, um, but these, these vocabularies also have um, relationships between the terms. And it's those relationships, uh, when we make them between the terms, that allow us to do things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, but a lot of these companies are basing, uh, their, they're embedding their business logic into, you know, for their recommendation engines and stuff mm -hmm. into these ontologies. And, yeah. and so they're reticent to, to let these ontologies go out into the wild. And so the question then for the players is, how do I um, release appropriate amounts of language into the wild, help set standards, and align my business model with right. the emerging standards? And, and so we're actually building a platform as part of IC Foods to enable people to map their proprietary technologies into uh, the emerging standards. And protect them. Yeah, so they can protect theirs mm -hmm. and, and map specifically to, and, and, and so then, then that also works as a, a partnership matching mm -hmm. platform. Which is part of the reluctance and they may not understand how that might be able to occur. Right, uh, yeah. yeah, so I think peop the people we've been talking to feel a lot better about this idea of mapping their proprietary to, mm -hmm. you know, because they can, they can decide what those mappings are sure. as opposed to, you know, saying we don't want to give up our entire, you know, right. vocabulary system. Sure, sure. Um, so we've got uh, we've got some questions up here uh, on Slido. I'm going to let you all kind of look and see. Can I take that first like one? Um, what what's the one thing small CPG companies can do to obtain big data? Uh, a, I don't think it's fair to say that the big companies only work with the big brands. It particularly, I don't know as much about Oracle, but if you look at, for instance, Amazon or Google, they have AI platforms that you can access. They've got the web-based platforms that you can access. And there are ways, I think it's more an intention of small companies, small farmers, small hospitality restaurants, right? Do they have the intention to actually become data smart? And I think what we're going to see in the next coming years is that divide between the haves and the have-nots, those who have data and are capable of using it, and those who have said, I'm just going to continue doing it the same way. And then you can be really surprised one day when something changes and things don't look as good. There are a lot of companies out there that are enabled, in addition to those big platforms. So for instance, we're in a, in a, an investor in a company called um, Love With Food. And on its surface, it's merely um, a specialty snack subscription <coughs> service. However, what they're enabling is also analytics for small CPG companies. So now they can go out to their network of subscribers and get insights that you know, uh, a General Mills or someone like that may not, may be able to get through, you know, uh, user, user groups and so forth. Sure. Now the small CPGs can get that same sort of thing. That's my whole point about this access to the democratized technologies. Mm -hmm. It's becoming cheaper yeah. and faster and easier for small players to catch up with the big players. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I can speak specifically, uh, I agree with you because even when I was at Google, over 50% of Google's ad revenue was actually generated from self-serve, the, the small business sector doing it, their advertising on their own. And from Oracle specifically, we have what's called a data hotline. So if you just Google Oracle data hotline, you can um, email somebody, a live person who gets right back to you um, with questions around data, mostly around deployment of data for marketing and advertising. but. Um, Naughty Noah's. If you run into, if you have questions, honestly, uh, just email me. Um, I think my email and my information's on there, and I'd be happy to help you. Yeah. You, you know, ahead. since we just seem to be going down the list here, mm -hmm. kind of want to address uh, these last two: the average American improve the average American diet, and um, and and use essentially insights and trends, uh, use of that by nutrition and health educators. So, well. First of all, I, you know, um, if, if you were here last year, you probably heard me say, you know, stop freaking telling me to eat more kale uh, <laughs> and more spinach. Uh, because for me, that's, um, that's actually going to cause me to have kidney stones. And, and so um, the idea that there is a healthy food um, uh, or, or, or even demon foods uh, probably isn't right, but there are healthy food habits yeah. for individuals, and there are bad food habits for individuals, and we need to know individually how we respond to things, and, and that gets to this issue of personalization, which, of course, is easier to deliver when you have, you know, very uh, finite vocabularies that, you know, can 
describe things all the way down to the molecular level. Um, and, you know, part of the problem uh, in improving diet uh, for individuals and, and giving this information to nutrition and health educators is because we don't have these vocabularies. If you look at, you know, what we traditionally call the health care system, which is actually, I would argue, the medical care system, right? right? And, and, and we could, you know, health care should be part medical care, part food care, and your average physician has less than 0.2 units worth of nutrition training. Right. They don't know what they're talking about when they start talking about food, by and large. Mm -hmm. and some of them are trained, of course. Um, and, and part of that reason is we don't have a language to talk about food and health. We don't have a language to talk about health, right? We have amazing vocabularies that we put in the medical record to talk about diseases, diagnoses, drugs, that have been built by the medical establishments for years, mostly so that we can mine medical records to develop new drugs. But we don't have the same levels of vocabularies for physical activity, sleep, right. stress, and how do you want to feel? How do you, happiness, right? I mean, we've got lots of ways to describe depression, uh, but, but very few to describe happiness. Right. So, you know, I mean, look, I mean, one of the things I want to add to this, right, the, the, the gorilla in the room is price. There is an economics about all of this that determines sort of the, the trajectory of how you utilize this, these new sources of information, language of food, branding, right? Small companies, large companies, whatever, ultimately gets there. So the marketplace will dictate a lot of these trajectories about how it is that you modify your food, what is it that you're getting signals from the consumer marketplace. And so, you know, if $4 you know, for a quick grab of food is it, that's going to tell you pretty much how things get packaged. If it's $16 for a salad, that segments out exactly who these folks are. So the good news is that these new technologies, these new methodologies and so on will enable even more segmentation. And even what Professor talks about, this notion of personalization. Why should you eat kale just because it's deemed healthy? Right? It has to make sense for you on a personalized level. Yeah. I think the long trend is that personalization is, is coming. Yeah. It really is. And yeah. so in that sense, ultimately price becomes kind of a factor about, well, what is the health of the farming system that, that supplies it, right? That they can attain that price so that you can be sustainable, economic, and so on. So I think in the end, these are you know, large trends that are actually like percolating in the, in the space right now. Yeah. Do you have a comment? Oh, I was just going to make the, the comment. Uh, it's a bit ironic. Do you remember uh, last year when there were a bunch of Skittles that ran on the highway and everyone found out, oh, my gosh, dairy cows eat Skittles. It turns out dairy cows are fantastic food waste machines. They're underappreciated in that regard. Uh, and it, the thing that people don't realize is we actually have more information about dairy cows than we have about humans. There are rumen sensors that you can embed inside a cow to look at the health of their, their stomach, they have nutritious on site that are making sure they know exactly how many Skittles or Cheetos or, you know, old crop, uh, you know, byproduct is being fed to them. And they, they have a specific outcome that they're driving towards, which is, you know, producing milk. The other thing I'll just say is um, there's a startup that we've seen that is actually using uh, facial recognition. So as the cows come in in the milking barn, it will take a picture of that cow's face and say, you know, that cow doesn't look right. They'll pull that out of uh, the milking herd so that they don't get milked and someone can go take a look at it. We don't have that same sort of stuff for humans yet. Right, right. That's right. <laughs> what else? What else here? <laughs> anything, anything else on these questions? <laughs> well, I, I have a question because this is the one that I'm stuck with, which is if you look at all these nutrition, healthy eating apps, the dog's not eating the kale dog food, right? We're just not getting the stickiness. And... I think that that's a big challenge that we have, and I just don't, uh, you know, I know we don't have the language, but how do we, how do we break that cycle? I mean, behavior it, change you're talking about? Behavior change, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's not going to happen until we have language, really, to talk about it. I, I don't think. I, may, I could be wrong. Yeah. I, that, that's that's the, my hypothesis that drives everything I do, mm -hmm. is that um, we can we can essentially engineer you know, a marketplace where people are competing for, we, we align the, the economics and the, the profit motive with the broader aims to do societal and individual good. 
and um, we haven't done that, right? Your, your physician gets reimbursed for making you antidepressed, not for making you happy, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the economic incentives for, for both food companies and for medicine uh, have been perverted, and, and part of this new IT infrastructure is our ability to, to change that infrastructure and enable behavior change, not just by consumers, but by the, the players all along the value chain. And, but I, I'll say that I mean, if you look at the quantified self movement, right, we got tons of data. There's still some social sciences, whether it's gamification, mm -hmm. something that needs to happen to get that behavior change, and I'm stuck on that one. Yeah, not to harp on like the point I made before about like cost, right, but if in this new world of transparency, if you start to expose both the direct and indirect cost of food, you know, incorporating sustainability and so on, over a long period of time, people can make better decisions. Like take Amazon, right? They lowered a bunch of prices at Whole Foods for salmon and et cetera because they know. They use data clouds and everything else to predict price. So what does that mean? Oh, we can grow people into the center of the store, right? Does that change Whole Foods' model? It does. And, and so I think that when you incorporate true cost of food to include the opportunity cost of what's occurring, of health, of sustainable goals, of energy, and all of it, then you actually get something. But I don't know if the world's really ready for that. I think they are in pockets, but you know, the average person in Thailand could care less, right? They're just trying to you know, survive. There's a challenge. Oh, I'll, I'll hit this really quick. Steve, on this question about the Internet of Food Standards, there's nothing happening now, and this has been really eye-opening to me being at this conference, so I would love to connect on that because I think there's an opportunity. But right now, it, there's not that synergies there, so definitely reach out to me on that. And then on that second one, I think that there's alignment there because I think the relevancy, I think consumers today, even though everybody hates advertising, will say if it's relevant to me, then I'm open to it. And that's how brands have to you know, drive awareness. So I think that there can be alignment with authenticity and targeting as long as it's a relevant message to a consumer who's actually open to the message. Okay. Thank you. I think we're okay. out of time, so sure. thank you. Let's appreciate our panel. Uh, thank you so much to all of our presenters this morning. I'm uh, sort of mind boggled by all the ways to use data. Um, so time for breakouts. So before we head to our networking break, which you'll have about 15 minutes for a breakout start at 10.50, just some reminders of where everything is. So if you look on the back of your badge, if you've pre-selected a breakout, it'll tell you which one. If you haven't, we'll just ask you to stand in a standby line. Um, unfortunately, one of our breakout presenters, Matt Roth, um, so the energetic design thinker that we saw in the general or the main stage yesterday, had a family emergency and couldn't be with us today. So we're thinking of him. So anyone that signed up for that breakout, you've received an email, um, but we will accommodate you as much as we can in another session. I would recommend our plant-based session, which is going to be in this room. We've got really great speakers, and I think we're going to break into some really interesting trends that you'll be seeing on menus and in products. Um, but for our breakout session, so B1, the future of Plant Forward, will be in this room, which will open up at 1050. Uh, harvesting Innovation will be in the Napa Valley Vintage Theater, which is on the first floor, so past where you had breakfast today. And then B4, from Idea to Shelf, will be in the Food Business School classroom, which is up the second floor in the central staircase to the right. Thank you.
This is Uncut with Matt Abdu at Pig Bleaker in the West Village of New York City. Having two restaurants is really kind of special for me because I get to really focus on all of my loves of cooking. Pig Beach is our Brooklyn barbecue spot, which focuses mostly on traditional barbecue, but with our New York City twist to it. And Pig Bleaker is our refined, smoke-centric comfort food restaurant, where we're taking all that theme from barbecue, but refining it to make it something more unique. So I am half Italian, half Lebanese, and I grew up my entire life with the Lebanese side telling me to sakdain and the Italian side telling me to manja, both of which just mean eat, live, love, be happy. There was no greater representation of love in my family than through food. It just really made me who I am today. Today we're making a smoked pastrami pork leg with a sweet and spicy barbecue mustard sauce. This dish plays very well on our menu here because all the processes of brining, rubbing, and smoking just create such depth of flavor that it really jumps off the palate the second you eat it. And when people see brined, smoked, rubbed pastrami ham, it's one of those things that just jumps on their mind of, oh wow, I want to try this. So we take the outside muscle of a fresh leg of pork and we first begin by brining it in a traditional pastrami brine. In our pastrami brine we have water, salt, brown sugar, cure number one, black pepper, pickling spice, and smashed garlic. After it's brined, we pat it dry, season it pretty liberally with a house-made pastrami rub. The rub is what's really giving us all that delicious pastrami flavor and pizzazz. That, combined with the smoke, is what really separates this from being a traditional hand and making it something really unique. Our pastrami rub has kosher salt, ground coriander, Butcher grind black pepper, sweet paprika, granulated garlic, granulated onion, Coleman's mustard powder, and light brown sugar. Season that pretty liberally, and then we place it in our smoker. Remove it from the smoker around 135 degrees. Let it rest for an hour and a half to carry up to about 145 degrees before serving. The mustard has yellow mustard, white granulated sugar, light brown sugar, apple cider vinegar, ketchup, kosher salt, Worcestershire sauce, granulated onion, granulated garlic, Frank's Red Hot, and ground black pepper. The outside muscle of this fresh pork leg is just smothered in love, from the brining process, to the rubbing process, to the smoking process, and then the applications are really endless in what you can use it for. It can be sliced paper thin and put in a Cuban sandwich, or it can be sliced and let on its own to be representative of a ham board with our country hams. It has all that love just wrapped up into one beautiful protein. So our Cuban sandwich has mustard sauce, house cured pickles, our pastrami smoked pork leg, a roasted pork loin, and melted Swiss cheese. You're getting not only that succulent, smoke, roasted, ham and pork loin, but you're also getting that crisp texture of acidity of the pickles and that mustard with the unctuous cheese. It just really plays super well when you grill that bread and it's got that crunch. It just makes you want to keep biting back for more. Me personally, I would love to eat some sliced ham steak or a Cuban sandwich with a rosé or even Pinot Noir if you wanted to go that heavy. Food has that unique ability to make you just feel warm and good or put a smile on your face. And I love that all my life.